Hello, everyone. This is another episode of the Unisoft question. Uh, we meet very interesting people here, usually lawyers. And today we also have a, a, an interesting guest. He is from BC. His name is Darren Thompson. He is a lawyer. He is a, a legal technologist, I would say. He is a producer of a podcast uh, on these issues. And without further ado, I will pass the floor to Darren and let him introduce himself. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and uh, looking forward to talking to you about uh, hopefully a range of uh, interesting and maybe related, maybe unrelated topics. Let's give it a shot. Exactly. I think we both share interest in bringing progress to law and to the legal system. Sometimes it feels like progress as we know it in this society is on its own track and uh, the legal system and law are on their own track. I'm not saying that they are not progressing, but it feels like they have different tracks. One is fast and the other one is not so fast. Uh, I know that most lawyers are not engineers or programmers uh, and uh, are not necessarily experts in technology. Uh, as far as I know, you also, do not really come from an engineering background, right? Or a software development background, yet you are in this field. What uh, uh, brought you to this field? Why are you interested in legal technology and in uh, developing uh, a new legal system? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, those are all interesting questions. The, the first one uh, that I'll talk about is, uh, I guess, why I'm interested in doing things differently than uh, than maybe they 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 seem to be done. Um, just generally, I think that the law is full of so many incredibly smart people, uh, lawyers, judges, uh, a range of different legal professionals, people um, working in and around the system. We got a lot of collective brain power. Like it's. Uh, I think we're really fortunate, really privileged in that way to have so many smart people and driven people too. Let's be clear: we the the classic the the cliche of the lawyer is the driven um, uh, person, the A type. Yet we still have uh, a lot of problems. We have a lot of challenges, and um, for me, I, I was I would just never settle for it. Uh, I I thought that. There were still a lot of different things we could do differently, a lot of ways we could improve the system, and a, and a lot of um, a, a lot of things we could do to make the law work better for both for litigation and for transactional um, type types of of law. So, when I was practicing, I, I spent a short time in private practice. A, a partner in my law firm uh, one day. Uh, was talking to me at a Christmas party. Everybody had, had a few glasses of wine and uh, was sort of letting down their guard. Although this person who uh, I just think is a great, great guy and a great lawyer um, didn't really need wine to let down his guard. He was pretty forward uh, most times. But he said to me, uh, he said, what, what is it with you? Um, he used a little more colorful language than I've just used. But anyways, he said, what is it with you? I send you out to do a research memo and uh, you come into my office, you know, half a day later and say, the system is doing this wrong and the courts are doing this wrong and the law treats this thing wrong. And, and I would say, that's fine. Just, you know, go out and finish the memo. I just need that memo. And uh, a couple hours later, you'd come back in my office and tell me what you'd found and then be telling me all the things that were being done wrong. And uh I think he nailed it. Uh, he he. I had trouble. I could I could still write the memo. I could do a pretty good memo at the end of the day, but um, I would have a terrible time getting caught up on all of the things that were happening, all of the ways that the law was uh, being done. That uh, I couldn't understand why they would be designed that way and why we continue to do it that way, even once we realized that it wasn't working well. So that kind of brought my. Uh, it was kind of a, a good illustration of where my compass and my orientation, I guess, points me when it comes to uh, law and how things are done. So um, as I got into, uh, later on, I, I started working for government. 
and I was fortunate to work in an office that um, was pushing hard on the on the justice system to try and find ways to improve the system. Lots of looking at uh, alternative uh, dispute resolution, um, uh, lots of you know different ways to sort of push the public justice system in uh, you know away from the the bad and and in a direction towards the good, and. Our office realized around 2008, 2009, that technology held um, a, a lot of potential promise. It was still a sort of undiscovered territory at that time. Uh, there was some e-filing. British Columbia has been e-filing since 2005. Uh, and you know, doing some court information, um, uh, court documents online, those sorts of things. But we were really interested in uh, ways that we could use technology to enable new processes. So since then, what I've come to realize is um, I, I am still very interested in technology, but I'm interested in technology second. What I'm really interested in is maybe I'm interested in technology third. What I'm really interested in is users and um, what the public needs, the, the system, rather than the justice providers, I'm interested in the users. And, and secondly, I'm interested in creating uh, the best processes that we can. Amazingly great, insanely great, to borrow Steve Jobs' language, and, and, uh, insanely great processes. It turns out that technology can be used to enable those. Uh, technology is the tool that can support a lot of these processes. So I've come to a point now where I don't start out with, okay, how can I use technology in the system? My starting point is what do my users need? Next is how can we build some insanely great processes for them? And then third, uh, what tools can we use to, to make these processes come alive and what platforms can we use? And, and very often it is technology, but uh, by no means exclusively technology. Humans are still at the core uh, of a lot of the, the, the things that I'm interested in. Okay. Uh, the human centric design is, am I understanding you correctly, is what you're interested in? Yeah, absolutely. Because this is exactly what another famous person from BC uh, told me about Shannon Salter, uh, chair of BC Civil Resolution Tribunal uh, in an interview. That's what she's all about. And she also said that technology was far behind uh, human centric design on her scale of priorities. So I'm wondering, uh, is it something about the West Coast where people <laughs> are into design and into um, uh, comfort for users? Because I have this uh, stupid uh, way to kill time. Sometimes I look at houses uh, uh, in British Columbia and I know I'll, I'm, I'm never going to buy them, but I just look at uh, MLS uh, entries and I noticed that uh, they build more beautifully in BC. <laughs> <laughs> and even in Alberta, right? It's like Alberta is getting some of that. I mean, with all due respect to Alberta, but Ontario is just boxes, boxes, boxes. So I'm really curious if it's something about the West Coast that makes people really interested uh, and attracted to human-centric design. Because uh, we've had an explosion of interest in legal technology this year because of COVID-19, an explosion of um, of of statements from various stakeholders and i don't think anyone ever talks about human-centric design or serving users first everybody is talking about how we avoid touching paper right, right? because the virus is on it or something like that but human-centric design uh is, is is obviously very important why uh do you have this priority why is it a priority on your agenda yeah, I don't know if there's something about the West Coast. Um, it's probably best to leave it for the people in uh, Central Canada and the East Coast to um, decide what it is that's unique or strange about us here uh, on the West Coast. It is a straight shot. We're the, we're the same time zone as, uh, as, as San Francisco and Silicon Valley and Stanford, where a lot of uh, legal design happens. But I know there's, there's um, uh, people interested in legal design and uh, all over the place, including uh, uh, the other side of North America and Europe, but um, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the 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 two ways to frame this discussion. One you, you mentioned focus uh, on users. That's what I'm very passionate about. And the other one is that you know how can we avoid uh, touching paper? 
And I think that's, uh, you know, I think you're getting to a really important way to, or two different ways to frame uh, our discussion. On the one hand, like I said, we could create, we can look at creating um, uh, processes that are value or outcomes for users. This is for the people that we serve, the members of the public, the businesses, uh, anybody who has to resort to the justice system to, to get some sort of outcome or output. So we can, we can focus on them and um, design processes that work for them, design processes to deliver that value, but that still uh, work for those people. Let's look at the other way of framing it. Again, how do we avoid touching paper? I think what, what I hear from that or what I take from that is uh, quite often that is uh, an effort to um, uh, digitize the existing system. So when you talk about avoid touching paper, you're still talking about a document or you're talking about a form, the F word for me when I'm doing legal design. Uh, the um, you're taking the artifacts of the current system and the steps we do in the current system, and you're trying to find ways to create electro electronic uh, substitutes. And that's been very popular since the pandemic started, of course, when the courts uh, effectively shut down for uh, several months. They had to figure out how to how to get um, get things moving again. And and what it seemed to me was a, a lot of the a lot of the efforts were focused on creating digital versions of the status quo. So let's do video hearings. Um, you know, let's let's find ways to exchange electronic documents. So I applaud those efforts, and um, I think I think that's great. But what's the focus in that second type of framing? The focus is on our processes and on the things we use and on our forms and creating electronic versions of those. It's different, in my mind anyways, it's different than focusing on the users. I start with what does my user want? What do, what do they need? What are they capable of? What is it that they can't do? And try and design a system around them. I'm putting them at the center, as you say, the, the user-centric design. And uh, again, it's different than saying, okay, here's how we make the widgets and how we've made the widgets for the last few centuries. Let's see if we can create an electronic version of that process of making making the widget. So um, I hope, I hope uh, that kind of comes through. You can, you can see the differences there. Uh, to, to boil it down to a form, uh, rather than create an electronic court form, I would I'd boil things down to first principles if I could and say, hmm, what is it that we need from this user? I'm probably going to discover that we need some of their information. Great, let's focus on the information. Let's figure out what the best, easiest way is to collect information from somebody. Is it gonna be a, a court form? Maybe, but if we do user testing and uh, take a user-centric design approach, I doubt it's going to be an, uh, you know, an electronic court form. It'll probably be another way to extract information from a user. And then once we get it, that, a hold of that information, let's put it to work in our, in our system. So those are just examples, again, where you really boil things down to first principles, focus on the users. You're less hung up with the way things have always been done. Uh, and um, you're not just trying to create a digital version of the status quo. Well, the last thing I'll say, though, because I know I'm into dangerous territory here for lawyers, not just on the cultural side, but from uh, you know the principles that we that we hold dear in justice, is it's entirely possible to address uh, within this creating a new process sort of thing uh, approach. It's entirely possible to. Uh, do things like address procedural fairness um, and uh, to create fair and you know just processes for uh, handling these disputes. Uh, it's there isn't only one way to do it, um, the historical way. You know, you hit a nerve there. I wrote an article on SLAW last year before the pandemic, and uh, it was in defense of a law society of Ontario's uh, advisory or recommendation against virtual commissioning, right? So people were shocked. I mean, you are a proponent of technology. Why are you supporting this backward view 
um, of course, the view has changed since because there was no choice. It was right. either virtual or you don't have affidavits anymore and the justice system grinds to a halt. And uh, I, 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 I talked about the same thing that I think, I think that you're talking about now. And I think what you're talking about is con contrasting digital simulation of existing processes with designing electronic process, processes natively uh, to serve uh, users, to serve use cases. So contrasting this two. And the, the former is of course, the wider and the easier road. And this is exactly what Ontario is doing right now uh, because for the first time ever in history, we now have full online court filing in Ontario Superior Court. And uh, the way it works is basically there is a website where you upload the PDF of what previously was printed out, right. bound and tabbed. Yeah. With, with a blue back sheet, right? <laughs> so this is, this is exactly what you're talking about, I, I think, uh, where they're simply simulating uh, the, the existing process in a digital way. And uh, everybody is ec ecstatic. The lawyers are simply so happy. And my life has changed a lot. I'm, I'm saving my clients hundreds of dollars every, right. every week probably in the court file, you know, processor fees and everything like that. But it's not what you're talking about. It's not what you want. What you want is uh, probably uh, a, some kind of website that will collect information that is currently in the PDF motion record uh, through uh, uh, a web form that validates entries and that will prevent incorrect entries automatically, uh, perhaps a website that automatically authenticates the sender. So there is no need for commissioning affidavits anymore. And then uh, if that's what you're proposing, then there is a problem that this pr proposal will solve. And you know what the problem is in Ontario? Uh, except a small subset of documents, you have to wait for up to five days for court staff to review your PDF and confirm that it was officially filed. So simply hitting submit and receiving a confirmation uh, that the form went through is not considered to be court filing. It is only considered to be court filing after you receive an email from court staff that physically inspected the PDF. And of course the date of the filing is not going to be probably the same day you uploaded the form or you submitted the form. It's going to be the date that court staff vetted the PDF. And uh, that's, that's uh, electronic simulation or digital simulation of an existing process for you. I mean, it's way better than the existing process, but there are still drawbacks with your proposal uh, which I implemented for you on the go uh, because I think we're on the same wavelength. Uh, you wouldn't have a delay. The, the uh, system will just tell you that it's accepted because the software validated it. But here's the question. It is much more expensive in my opinion to design and to build and to deploy and to maintain a, a, a digitally native um, smart court filing system like that than simply uh, simulate an existing process with a form that accepts PDF. And uh, 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 also uh, uh, the designing a system like that from the ground up will result in uh, elimination of much of the court staff. So people will be let go, people will, will be fired. Uh, and uh, that's also going to be an issue. Um, what do you have to say about this? Uh, first, I should say too that uh... The greater use of technology, I don't. I, I should be careful not to like corner myself into a dichotomy here. I am not opposed to some of the ch some of the changes that you've just. Sorry, talked my about that my, have cross -examin my cross examination <laughs> skills are, yeah. are are shining through. Sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, I I this is something I suffer from uh, my myself. So I want to say that I do support um, this more incremental uh, improvements using technology. Not opposed if they're if they're done right then uh, fantastic, bring it on. But I think, right. as I said, right at the beginning, we're, a, we're a, a profession that's full of like really, really smart people. And collectively, I think we have the potential to aim 
way higher and and do a lot more and make much bigger improvements. So um, in terms of the the question that you asked though, uh, uh, I hear this one a lot. When I first started talking about using more technology in justice uh, processes, that was definitely something that people would bring up. Like, aren't you gonna put people out of business? Uh, put people out of a job, the people who work in the registries, and eventually judges, if you're, um, you know, having systems that can do decisions, you're trying to put judges out of work. The first thing I'll say is from a business case perspective, yeah, people are the important, or sorry, not, not only the important, but also the most expensive part of our system. That is what makes our system more and more expensive year after year is the people that we have to pay to, to um, administer our public system. But we have so much backlog. The unmet demand in Canada and most other developed countries, the unmet demand is so great that we are not, I think, going to be firing any people if we created more capacity in our system. If we cre if we increase the capacity in our system by an order of, you know, um, say, say 50% more capacity, 75% uh, more capacity, I think we're still not going to eliminate the unmet demand, all of the, the demand that the system currently can't address. So what I'm more interested in is saying, okay, we've got people working in the system at, from uh, the, the Court of Appeal judges and justices right down to the, the clerk who works in the registry. What I want to do is design systems, design processes, design systems, use technologies that free those resources up, that help them climb up the value chain to do more interesting, more rewarding work that frankly can't be easily automated. So um, another way to look at it is if, if I have a person who's dedicated to their job and they're smart and they care a lot about the system, they care about the meaning, to, you know, intertwined with their role, I don't want them to be doing a job that is mindless and repetitive and, you know, manual. I, I don't want them to be doing that all day. I want them to be doing something great. Instead of stamping a document over and over again, uh, I want them to help uh, you know, help the litigant, uh, the self-represented litigant who doesn't even know how to start. I want the, to help them to be talking to them or helping them or doing a more complex task, not doing the same repetitive thing over and over again. So this this uh, view, uh, by the way, applies for, for legal practice as well. Uh, you know, according to some people, so much of what lawyers do is just repetitive work that absolutely can be automated, we should automate that. Are lawyers going to be out of work? No, because there are, um, there is so much demand on that, you know, ways that we're not serving the public. Imagine if we could automate some work and uh, drive our volumes way up and our margins down a little lower and find ways to serve a lot more people uh, more economically. You, you, um, you, you wouldn't even be scratching the surface of the unmet uh, demand. So yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm not seeing us uh, uh, laying off people just because we're starting to use technology. What I see instead is uh, freeing up people to do more important things, to make the best use of, of the human resources that we have. And having to hire new people, uh, potentially, who know how to program the technology, who know how to um, you know, build and maintain these systems. So I, we've taught in a few uh, universities, we've taught students our methodology that we call knowledge engineering, where you're capturing knowledge from a human expert and putting it into an intelligent system so that that system, once you turn it on, could just serve people over and over again 24-7. Well, that's a new role, a knowledge engineer who um, who learns the methodology that we created and uh, goes out and do this. So that's just one example of a new job. But um, yeah, anyways, I don't know. Are some of those uh, points resonating? Does it, does it uh, sound convincing to you? Yes, well, uh, absolutely. And I have a follow-up question because you mentioned knowledge systems, uh, which I understand uh, are also known as expert systems. And I know that there are a lot of materials on your website about expert systems. So in this regard, 
Can you give uh, us some examples of expert systems in uh, law and in the legal system that already exist or that you would like to see? Yeah, the, the one that uh, was built out here in British Columbia is called the Solution Explorer. And it's, uh, a for, it's the first dispute resolution phase for people coming to the Civil Resolution Tribunal. Uh, before I jump into what the roles and functions or how that system is used uh, for the Civil Resolution Tribunal, I'll, I'll just say generally, expert systems are, um, it's a system, a technology-based system that's made to imitate or emulate the interactions you might have with a human expert. So uh, the, the system is intelligent because we've gone out and collected knowledge from humans and put it into a knowledge base that's within the system, but the system has to be designed, the knowledge base has to be designed in a certain way so that the system can work with it. If you do it right, a system, an expert system like this can, it can make deductions. It can, uh, it can apply conditional logic to certain inputs. It can apply from a, to get more into law, it can apply facts to law. So the user's putting in their facts or circumstances, the system can apply those to law. So um, to bring it back to the, the solution explorer that the civil resolution tribunal, tribunal uses, I usually organize it into four sort of buckets and uh, in terms of defining the functions or the value that it provides for citizens here in BC. Uh, firstly, it can diagnose your dispute. And that's that's really important for people who want to engage with the justice system. If something bad happens to you in a transaction and you're a um, person who's not familiar with the law, you're not going to have a, an immediate sense of how to um, characterize it in legal terms, right? So um, there's nothing like organic about the way we come up with some of the causes of action or the statutes that might apply. These were all invented by humans and only the people who have the knowledge know how to do it. So we try and uh, uh, deliver some of that through the Solution Explorer. So it can help diagnose a dispute as a, you know, either a, a, a consumer dispute as opposed to a motor vehicle personal injury dispute. And if you uh, are looking into the consumer uh, basket or uh, domain, you can diagnose it further as um, something to which consumer legislation applies because you know that this person bought something from a business who's in the business of selling that good or service. So you, you can keep um, diagnosing as narrowly and as granular uh, as you need to for the, um, for the user. And then the second thing after we diagnose is provide information. There are a lot of organizations out there providing information to the public to try and uh, get them to help to try and get them the help they need to use the system. And here in BC, we call them public legal education and information organizations, uh, plea organizations, and they do amazing work and they have a tough job and uh, not a lot of resources. And they manage to, again, do, uh, just do great things. But what we try and do that's a little differently in uh, using the Solution Explorer is we don't, we try to avoid having to send people out to different organizations and different websites and different offices and different front counters. Uh, we try and pull all the information that the user needs right into the system and not overwhelm them. So if you go to a public legal education information website and there's a 20 page PDF and it's only, you know, the third paragraph on page 17 that applies to your situation, there's chances are you might not find that if you're um, somebody who's not familiar with the law. With the system, we can pinpoint uh, that sort of information and deliver it directly to the user once we've diagnosed their dispute. We know this is the information that they do need, and we don't have to tell them about all that other stuff that was that was around there. So uh, diagnose, inform, and then we try and provide some self-help. So uh, imagine, you know, asking a question like, are there things this user could do to resolve this dispute on their own? And if not, are there things they can do to start to manage it or contain it so that it doesn't get any worse. Some of the self-help is incredibly basic. Uh, it could be a communication template, like a letter or email template to send to somebody, but we can populate, because we diagnosed the user's situation, we can populate that template with the exact information that a human expert has told us 
should be in this communication, the details about the consumer product, the date it was purchased, you know, whatever the human expert tells us we need, we can build that right into the system. So after the diagnosis, the information, the self-help, the last uh, sort of bucket that I describe is uh, streaming and triage. I kind of put them together. So streaming just basically means the system is set up to send the person to the place where they should go next to continue to receive the help from uh, from the system for their problem. In a lot of cases, the way the CRT's Solution Explorer works, that passes you through to the CRT intake process. So while you're using the system, you haven't paid a fee, you haven't uh, filed a dispute or anything like that, you haven't started a proceeding, but um, you can uh, be passed to the next phase. If the interaction you've had with the system suggests that's the best thing for you to do next. There might be cases though, where that's not what our user needs. And they might have something more urgent. This is where triage comes in. So if the user has a, a loans and debt situation and they've interacted with the system and maybe they've told the system that, yeah, I am uh, never going to be able to repay this loan, like based on my finances, it's just not going to happen. We don't wanna send that person into a legal proceeding because um, they need to go somewhere else. They might need to go to a debt consolidation uh, service. They might need to go to a trustee in bankruptcy. Uh, to talk about uh, other things that they could do. So that's just one example, but the the broader um, s sort of description again is diagnose, inform, uh, self-help, and then uh, streaming or triage. And we're trying to create a system that can do a lot of things like uh, from a user's perspective, make it so that as soon as they start, they're in the right place. We take the the burden off of them to have to decide where to go next or what to do, or am I doing this right? And when we try and build all of that right into the system. Uh, but th from the administration of justice perspective, we're also trying to make it so that the people who come through are ready to receive that service. They kind of know what's going on. We've put some, um, we've put some structure around their dispute and help them uh, uh, see uh, you know, what's involved, the way they need to frame things, and maybe even manage their expectations. So that uh, with this expectation management, some people are going to say, you know what, uh, this isn't worth it to me to continue in this process. Now that I see how this all goes and what law applies, I'm, I might not um, want to continue. So um, I hope you're, um, you or other people listening to this might be, uh, especially who deliver legal services to people might be saying, yeah, that's kind of what I do. Uh, I uh, give people some information based on my experience and my knowledge and help set their expectations about what comes next. So that's just one example of a way that we can use a, a very basic system. Uh, and it's 1980s era artificial intelligence uh, to uh, provide some of this value to the public. And such systems are in wide use everywhere except the justice system or yeah. the legal system. TurboTax right? is one that people or quick tax, uh, often mm. people say is, uh, is an example of an expert system that takes a complicated area and puts it, you know, makes well, it easy for the average person. Absolutely. So tax returns, I don't know, any SaaS, any software as a service really works like that, right? right. Um, I'm sure PayPal, PayPal does a lot of that in the background for compliance reasons. I'm sure they don't have like teams of lawyers review every transaction and things like that. They would go out of business, right? So it's, it's really fascinating how law is when you study it and when you practice it, you realize that it, it is a system of categories. It's a very analytical system that attempts to break down the complexity of the world into neat categories, fit the facts into these categories, and then generate some kind of judgment or conclusion about these facts. And one would think that it really lends itself very well to uh, a digital system, to an expert system. Yet here we are, if law is digitized, it's usually digitized by simulating the, an existing process. And uh, I guess I want to ask you why. I, mean, I have some idea about it, but I don't really think, apart from the Solution Explorer, by the way, did you help design it? 
in BC. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was uh, lucky to be part of the team that uh, came up with the concept and and uh, designed it and and uh, did the user testing and and deployed it. It's a it's a, I'm not involved in the administration uh, of the mm -hmm. system now, but uh, yeah. Do you know if there is some kind of strong waiver or disclaimer of liability in uh, uh, in the CRT's terms of service? It's uh, yeah. It, there there are terms of service. I I won't go into them, but uh, right. you can absolutely go ahead and and uh, and read them. Uh, they just uh, go through the system as if you were a, a user who is preparing to use it, and and yeah. you'll see them there. Uh, if you're worried about um, you know liability or giving legal advice, it's something that the team pay very close attention to. Took it very seriously. But right. at the same time, we're trying not to replicate this thing that happens over and over again, where uh, uh, public legal uh, information will say, okay, looks like you got this type of dispute. This is complicated. You should go see a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. we, did, we didn't want to uh, replicate that dynamic. There are certainly uh, tons and tons of places in the Solution Explorer where people can say, yeah, I want to get professional help. And then it will uh, take you to a directory of uh, where you can uh, go ahead and, and try and get a, a lawyer. But that's not the only thing uh, that happened. Absolutely. And we tried to share some of the, sort of the, the knowledge that was appropriate uh, with the system. Do you think such expert systems will forever be relegated to small claims? which CRT basically is. I mean, they also handle bigger files, which I was really surprised to learn, like all condominium disputes, yeah. right? So it's yeah. really incredible. But uh, do you think this is this is the fate of expert systems in, in law, where the stakes are the lowest? Yeah, uh, yeah. I could tie it to your. I could tie it to your other quest, like the question that you asked. Sorry, just before I, I went off on a tangent there about why it's you know maybe why it's not happening more. Um. And uh, it's culture, right? Uh, we're a, 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 a profession and a, a, a field that doesn't take change uh, too easily. <laughs> uh, it's uh, sort of kicking and screaming. Um, it cha changes. That's the way they happen sometimes. And um, this has been the story of online dispute resolution. This has been the story of using technologies to go in uh, very, very uh, cautiously, which is which is appropriate because it's new. Uh, but uh, I don't think that an expert system needs to be limited to um, uh, small claims. And again, as you, as you note, the CRT handles uh, personal injury up to um, uh, a pretty high dollar amount it, it handles uh condo cases with uh, really no uh, dollar limit so it can it can handle big things but um it all comes down to design and uh, i you know you could design you can design an expert system to deal with medicine where people's lives are on the line uh it's just a matter of inputting the right information you could design an expert system to uh, give information to a pilot on a commercial aircraft uh, it, the expert systems aren't uh, unique to law they can be really used in any domain and so it's up to us as the knowledge engineers and the system administrators to ask the big questions is this appropriate uh, how do we design it? How do we design it so that it's safe? And what are some of the problems that we foresee and how can we mitigate them? I'll be the first to say that these um, the systems aren't perfect. Um, I, I'll, I won't make that claim, but uh, the human delivered model isn't perfect either. And uh, so I, I wouldn't make that claim either. And uh, there are different ways, whether it's a human delivered sort of service or an expert system or technology-based service, there are different ways that we can identify and uh, address or mitigate some of the risks. So um, it would just depend on the issue. And uh, I would say, okay, how do we design around this? Let's see if we can, uh, it's, if we can make it safer. So. Yeah, people ask me from time to time, just generally, about online dispute resolution. Uh, I think they can handle. I think they can handle the biggest, most complex cases. In fact, I think they'd be a lot more appropriate for some of the bigger, uh, more complex cases. But again, um, 
I don't want to be in a dichotomy here. Part of the part of the reason I say that is because I wouldn't just use technology. I would use a mix of technology and and uh, and more legacy based uh, processes, all within the same uh, sort of matter or system. Uh, when once you mix these two approaches uh, or multiple approaches, things become a lot easier and uh, and safer and flexible. Would you say that law as a practice and as a system of government is more conservative because it deals with human behavior as opposed to medicine, for example, which deals with, even when it deals with our bodies, it usually deals with a physical world subject to the laws of nature. And human behavior is not really subject to any uh, objective laws. And, they say that every case is different, especially the lawyers like saying, oh, every case is different, right? That's often a, a cover for uh, ex ex excusing the high fees and saying, well, I have to do it from scratch. You know, your case is unique yeah. and never, never happened in a million right. years, which is not right. true in many, many areas of, of law. But then again, just to get back to this, law deals with human behavior. Cases are often uh, unique or at least have some unique feature. And uh, unlike medicine, for example, where you can have reasonable checklists or expert systems uh, that can uh, statistically generate uh, the same outcomes over many, many cases in law, there is a higher risk. Uh, and also the difference, uh, uh, the unique thing about law is that the stakes are high, right? Spe specifically, there are monetary stakes and they can be inf you know, infinite, uh, great. So another area uh, similar to law where there is the same combination of unpredictable human facts and high stakes is waging wars, yeah. for example. I think that's very similar. And I, don't, I can't really think of any other uh, su uh, subjects or fields of human endeavor. So it's law and waging wars that, are unpredictable, that have unpredictable facts and extremely high stakes. How do experts system that? Yeah, again, I, I, um, there's lots of different ways to, if we were dealing specifically with expert systems, there's, there's lots of different ways to address or um, uh, make to allow for variability. So you can take someone using the system uh, pretty far, but not go too far. And you can say, you know, uh, this is just using my language, you would say, uh, it's common practice for this type of issue for people to do X or to do Y, but that may not apply in your case. I mean, there's lot there's lots of uh, ways to to do that. The bigger question, though, that that I thought was really interesting that you're bringing up, you know, co drawing comparisons between uh, medicine and law and uh, why one has changed more than the other. I honestly don't know. Uh, the, the answer, but I do find the question really fascinating. And I like to think about it. The, the one thing you and I could do as a thought experiment, though, would be to take somebody, I don't know if we took some, somebody in our justice system who really calls the shots, you know, a very, very senior justice or court of appeal justice, a, a chief justice, and um, uh, tell them, you know, uh, we think we, you're going to need some brain surgery. And uh, it's a, not a super risky operation, but they are going to have to open you up and go in uh, with the scalpels and start doing some, some things to the, the, your brain. As you roll them uh, toward the, uh, down the hallway to make this happen, imagine that there's two operating rooms there. And uh, door A is the operating room that um, is framed on the way op brain surgery was done two or 300 years ago. It still has the same tools that were used 200, two or 300 years ago. It still has the same practices. Maybe we weren't really into uh, uh, sanitizing our instruments and all of those sorts of things. You had the person with the big saw that didn't get cleaned. and uh, Or you can go into room we can wheel you into that room and that room has brain imaging where we can see the inside of your brain and the problem before we even open you up and we have these you know tools that use technology and magnification and monitoring and uh, we can control your anesthetic in a, in a much more refined way even 
Um, what do you think that that very senior judge or justice is going to choose? And um, I hope I hope we all know the answer. So uh, just as an aside, like when the pandemic started, I remember thinking, wow, I'm sure glad that medicine embraces technology and change. And look what's happened, right? We have, um, they've developed uh, vaccinations or vaccines uh, in record time, I'm, uh, I'm told. So, uh, but law is different. Now, I think if I had to argue, if, if, you, if you force me to argue um, for why we won't change, I think you're getting into the, you got into some of the interesting things about like a, you know, we want a constitution for a state. We want it to hold up. Um, when you have a bad actor who comes along and maybe gets elected to the highest office of that state uh, and starts doing things that are um, outside the norm, you want to be able to point to your laws and, and your constitutions and say, look, this is the baseline. This thing has to stay. You can't just go in there and change it and wipe it out and do whatever you feel like and, and um, recreate the world. So there are absolutely, I think, uh, times and, and aspects of our system that we want to be more uh, 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 solid and immutable and uh, want to hold on to that. But we don't need everything to stay that way. Uh, there are many different things we can do. We can do things differently, make improvements, but still hold on to those core principles. We can still hold on to that, uh, that foundation of law and the things that are really important. But we do, I think, need to open our eyes to different ways of, of getting there. And there are countless examples all across the system. So, uh, but yeah, hold on to that thought experiment. The next time you go into the hospital or uh, need some medicine or, or dentistry, maybe that's a, a visceral sort of uh, way to think about it. Um, do you want the technique that was done uh, two or 300 years ago? Do you wanna go see the dentist who refuses uh, to consider something new because it might, it might not work or it might be different. Um, I, I think the choice is pretty easy there. Right. Uh, one last uh, area that I wanted to dig in is trial judges. And one of their functions is finding facts. You can always go to the court of appeal uh, if you're if you don't like the trial judgment, but one thing that appellate judges don't like doing is they, they or they will never do they, they they will never rehear the case they will never look at the evidence to find facts they trust they defer to the trial judge to find facts and isn't this a purely human exercise finding facts uh, listening to competing versions of what happened, not applying the law apart from evidence law, apart from the law of evidence, which is a whole different matter, but just listening to two narratives, uh, listening to two witnesses and deciding whom to believe. Isn't that a purely human exercise that computers are not going to be capable of at least until full featured AI is developed? When this comes up a lot, um, it's a it's a again an, a fantastic illustration of why we might not want to use technology. Uh, we it might impair our uh, methods for doing things like finding fact. Or it again, if you got two different witnesses telling different versions of what happened, uh, you you need to we we have ways in the legal system that we've developed to decide which which uh, which evidence you're going to rely on which one to prefer and uh, this is where i really <laughs> it's such a great example um i would say um, do we know if those methods work like it's one thing to say hey this is the way we've done it for the last two or three centuries and we're not just going to throw that out the window um uh, for no good reason uh but my, the way I'd come at it is, uh, what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to figure out who's telling the truth. And then I would say like, well, are there ways to measure it? Is there a way to use um, data? Is there a way to use science to see whether this approach works? Um, I'd encourage you or uh, other people to listen to a conversation uh, that I recorded with uh, an expert in this area from, uh, he's, he's from uh, Canada, uh, Dr. Brent Snook, 
and uh, his er, one of the areas where he, he has um, done some research and writing on is the ability of humans to uh, detect lies in people or to detect deception is the way the uh, psychology points it out. It turns out we're terrible. Uh, humans are, are terrible. We, I think we hit about 53 or 54% accuracy when it comes to detecting deception, but we don't, that, uh, that's, that, that's a coin flip, right? But the scary part is we don't know we're bad at it. <laughs> we think we're good at it. There's no way to discover that you're bad at it until you measure it. And that's what psychologists have done. They've done meta uh, analyses where they've studied subjects that included over 20,000 uh, different subjects. And the data keeps showing we hit whatever, 53%. We hit a coin flip. Uh, and what they've been able to do is find that people who are professionals when it comes to detecting lies. So you're imagine the person who works at the border, a customs officer, uh, imagine a judge, that sort of thing. They, um, they're no better, uh, according to these studies, as, as I understand them at detecting lies, they think they're better, uh, which might even make them a little more, uh, a little more dangerous. So it's such a, um, it's such a great example and reason why we, as, as a bunch of smart people working in the law, dedicated people working in the law, people who want the system to work properly, who want the system to do the right thing, who want the system to be able to figure out who's telling the truth and who isn't, why we should be open to new ways of doing things. For me, this would be talking to the psychologist, this would be bringing in a lot more science, this would be trying to find out ways that uh, we can augment the human approaches to detecting lies. Imagine if we still let a human decide important questions like that. A judge, it's their job to decide um, who, who's telling the truth and how much weight to give the evidence. But imagine if we could give that judge a lot more tools to augment her approach to the subject. So imagine if we could do a text analysis using an algorithm that has been you know, tested a trillion times and seems to be pretty good at detecting lies based on the way people structure their, their language. Uh, this is real research that, that happens in some places. Or imagine if, I don't know, this gets a little bit scary, but you're hooking up uh, electrodes to a person's brain and you know which parts light up inside the brain when they're telling lies. Uh, we could say we don't want to do that. There's something about that that um, doesn't feel right and makes our skin crawl. But we have to be honest with ourselves too and open saying, yeah, we're going to keep on using the way. We're going to prefer the way that basically is the equivalent to flipping a coin. Um, do we want to settle for that? We can just, I think we should at least decide whether or not we're going to, to settle for that. We should have the best evidence in our hands, the best evidence available to us before we say, yeah, we're good with the coin flip. And again, that, um, that example can be used over and over lots of different uh, um, methods, lots of different uh, points throughout the system, uh, not just for finding fact. But for me, this is where um, my, my view of the world, my view of the law is, uh, we've just got too much knowledge and drive and dedication to settle for those sorts of things. That's, I think, why that partner at my law firm, what he was, what he was uh, putting his finger on, is that uh, we shouldn't settle. We don't have to settle. I think we can, we can get out there and find ways to uh, improve the system and, and uh, make it work better, make it do what it's supposed to. Thank you, Darren. This is thought provoking. Definitely opened my eyes on a few things and I really appreciate it. It was a great pleasure to speak with you today. And I want to wish you all the best in your efforts to improve and reform our legal system here in Canada. Thank you so much. Thanks. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you.